Welcome everyone to this uh, lunchtime chat. Um, we are going to be talking about grass, herbal lays, iodine, hedges, and maybe a little bit of mental health if we can fit it in. Um, I'm joined today by, um, well, first of all, I'm Nick Renison and I uh, cover um, the Northwest um, for AHDB Beef and Lamb. I'm joined today by Richard Carruthers, who's our strategic farmer in Cumbria. Um, Mark Jones, Richard's um, grassland consultant, Rachel Tennant, his vet from Frame and Swift Vets in Penrith. And I'm also, um, I've got Joseph, who I work with at AHDB, who's going to be my uh, man behind the scenes, so to speak. Um, so um, if we can just have the next slide, Joseph. So yeah, Joseph, so over I'm, to you. Can you just do this bit, please? Yeah, so I'll, I'm going to try and um, feed in questions as we as we go through. So we try and answer your questions as we um, as we go through the uh, the session. But just to make sure everybody can use it, um, if you haven't used GoToWebinar before, you should see the little uh, orange arrow at the top. Um, so if you click on that, you'll see um, a questions um, function. So you just click down and type in your question and press send. So it's it's fairly straightforward. Um, but we thought we might just have a quick check. So Nicola, do you have a question for them just to make sure it's all working? I do, I do. Um could you um, type in whereabouts you are in the country, like your nearest um, town or village, just so we get a rough idea of, of the spread on the call? And yes, they're coming in. Are they coming in? Yes, yes, starting to work. So yeah, that's good. So we have a good spread. Perfect. Perfect. Um, I will. I will hide myself away and uh, I will pop back up later when questions start coming in. Okay, so can we have the next slide, please, Josie? So, Richard, 12 months nearly, you've been a strategic farmer. How, how's it been? Yes, yes, yeah, 12 months, enjoyed it. It's been challenging, uh, slightly uncomfortable at times um when things haven't gone to plan um but yeah it's been great can't wait for the next uh year and see how that rolls out um so just just briefly for those who haven't um met you before just just give us a very brief rundown on on your farm yeah not to repeat myself because i've said it a few times um we have about 400 acres tenanted from the local estate um with a small bell right grazing sheep flock on there as well, running about a thousand ewes um, and a reducing suckler cow herd. I think we're down to about 45 suckler cows now and a small herd of pedigree Belgian blues or British blues and a few purebred wagus as a, a bit of a sideline. So that's where we're at. Okay, so if we can just go on to the next slide. So today we, we've only got an hour and I think it'll whiz, whiz by. So to begin with, um, Mark and Richard are going to talk through um, the subdivision that's taken place on the farm, Herbal Lays and uh, uh, Richard's cattle conundrum. And then uh, we're going to be joined by Rachel to talk about um, some lamb growth and iodine um, issues we've had on the farm. And at the end, we're going to have a, have a little chat about hedges and uh, carbon audits. So over to you, Mark and Richard, if you want to... Um, start your chat on on grass yeah okay oh. uh, could you have the next, next slide please right okay so uh, what we thought we'd look at to start with would be um richard's done quite a bit of reseeding this time so uh we thought we initially if, richard if you just want to explain what you've put in this time uh, in terms of different types of lays uh to start with please yeah, well, you see the slide on the bottom there. That field there was my uh, winter sacrifice field. Wintered quite a lot of sheep on there, around about 300. Um, um, so it was in a bit of a state, really, at springtime. So we uh, we did a proper reseed. I had to plow it, um, lime it, do the usual things. And we put a, a red and white grazing herbal mix in there. And we just chicory, plantain, red and white clover and a few other grasses in there. Um, so, 
so that was okay. It was slow. It was slow to get going because we were uh, we were quite dry at that time of year, end of April, which is unusual for us. But it really did get going once once it did rain. Um, visually very impressive. Yeah, and then um, how many acres do you think you you uh, reseeded in total? Um, that area there was about nine acres, and we have two other. Um, areas on the farm that we did direct drilled them um, with, with a similar with a similar mix, and there were about ten acres together. And we did try a forage crop as well for another ten acres, but that was a failure twice. Yeah, yeah. So quite a bit okay. really, more than we all always ever have done. Yeah. And then did you find any differences between the the reseeds where you were plowing and the the, the overseeding the direct drilling? Yeah. The uh, the traditional um, reseed was probably the best, um, even though it's more expensive with the ploughing, um, and even though it's frowned upon nowadays because of, of, of various reasons. Yeah, that was the best take and the best result. Um, the the direct drilling was okay. Um, again, it hit the first the first paddock. It hit quite a dry time and it struggled to get going. Um, and, and once it got going, it was okay. And the second paddock we did slightly later in the year, end of August, and it struggled because it had too much rain um, and, and, and really got a little bit wet and a bit cold. It's going now, but it has taken a while to get going. So, yeah. yeah. So, I suppose um, really when we were looking at the different types of lay, I think um, the priority uh, when we were, we were looking about 12 months ago was trying to finish lambs a little bit earlier wasn't it Richard so um the priority given was to try and get those lambs off farm a little bit earlier to then uh leave some space really for for the ewes at tupping time and we'll have slightly higher covers of grass going in the autumn to help body condition score and, and help flush the loop the ewes a little bit more um but um I suppose in terms of your experiences, uh, how did you think it went uh, this summer? I know we did have some issues on some of the herbal lays. Uh, so if you want to just explain some of those issues and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, the uh, as I say, the, 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 the crop grew really well once it was got what we weaned onto those on those magic crops didn't just do as um, as, as everybody seems to claim. Um, they were very, uh, very slow to get going um, and weighing them every couple of weeks and nothing was putting much weight on right through the summer. Um, so it, I was getting a bit disappointed with them really and I did, I did, did threaten to spray them and, and put the grass back in and, and, and walk away from them. But anyhow, I've stuck with it. Um, and as we come on to later on in discussion, we, we actually did find that there was a, an iodine deficiency within the lambs, um, which we think has held them back significantly so. yeah so yeah i was i must admit when i when i came out and saw the, the herbal lays i thought um yeah they looked in perfect condition uh and you were expecting sort of 250 300 grams ahead of day off them weren't you and uh they they weren't weren't doing at all so uh i'm glad something did pop up in the end because i was scratching my head and <laughs> when you try and recommend these things to the lamb when you're seeing it turns that into a uh yeah, it doesn't happen how you'd like it. It does get quite disappointing, really. But I think um, in the longer term, um, you know, you've got plenty of clover in those lays. We've got the chicory, uh, we've got the plantain, and it's all about just increasing the digestibility. So the quicker those lambs are able to digest it, uh, the more dry matter intakes they're able to have. So the perception of the idea is really that it should be able to drive intakes. I suppose the other the other side of it was probably the weather didn't quite help so maybe the dry matter of some of these lays was slightly uh, less than pure grass clover lays so maybe that, that had a little bit of an effect that they actually needed to eat a lot more of it to, to have that production and how, how much rain did you have Richard? Well I can't remember now but you know we live in a, in a wet place in the, one of the wettest places in the, in the country probably um, and, and yeah it, I don't know if it was unusually wet but it just seemed to be drizzling around most of the time during the summer. So there was a lot of, uh, just a lot of water in, the, in that lay. Um, even though we were re rotating the lambs round every couple of days, um, you know, so they're taking the best, the best bits all the time. It really was a challenge to uh, keep faith with it really. But um, yeah, 
we're up and running now. Lamb seem to be doing a lot better on them. Um, I've actually had to resort to a little bit of hard feed just to uh, just to finish them. But anyhow, that was the year, and, and it has worked. Yeah. So I suppose um, hopefully next year, um, hopefully we'll have sorted the iodine issue out, and then we'll hopefully know for sure the, the performance off them really. But hopefully they'll uh, they'll come good for you. <laughs> In the, in the longer term um, yeah and i haven't i haven't lost total faith in it um is you know we'll have a, a an area next year which i'll have wintered a lot of sheep on and we'll we'll put the same mix in again i have been quite impressed with it um so we'll keep rolling it out so we have quite a big platform for, for the lambs to keep spinning around on and then um, I suppose um, we should just mention that the dry spring you had and um, you did have quite a lack of grass grass at lamb time and that did have a bit of an effect in it and knock on on the sheep really. So just want to go briefly over the, the dry period and, and what you did or how you managed it? Well, I don't, I don't want to be too negative about the dry spring because it was fantastic during lambing time. You know, I don't think we had a wet day, which is, which is unheard of really. So, um, yeah, it was great for, for, for lambing, just that the ewes quickly caught up with any uh, any covers that I had spare and we had nowhere else to go. So we were eating down way past the ideal level into the covers, um, which, you know, affected grass growth going forward as well. So, yeah, it had a big impact on probably lamb weight gain, yaw condition and, and maybe grass growth as well because we, we grazed it too low because we had no other option. Uh, could we have the next slide, Joseph? Um, just before um, we go on to the next one, there's just one a few questions around herbalays and stuff, so I just thought I might as well ask them now. Um, well, the first part is, um, uh, well, the question was, where do you actually farm, uh, Richard? I don't think you actually mentioned it in your bio. Um, <laughs> yeah, we farm in the, in the Lake District in Cumbria, a little village called Bampton. Um, it has a reservoir at the head of the valley, so um, obviously it's been put there for good reason. It rains a lot, so that's where we're at in Cumbria. Cool. Um, so the next kind of two questions are kind of the same. It's about around the establishment of the herbal lays. Um, so is it possible to establish them in permanent pasture, um, perhaps through overseeding or letting them grow without fertilizer? And then the next question, kind of on similar lines, is did you spray off the previous grass? Before direct drilling the herbal lay, and did you have any problems with weeds in the new the new lay? So, Should I go um, first, Mark? Yeah, Richard, if you want to go first. Yeah, yeah, we did spray off the uh, the two other areas um, before we direct drilled. Put some lime on, slug pellets, and the, and the full works. Um, the, yeah, the weeds haven't been an issue. We, uh, early season, but we do have a bit of an issue with uh, thistles at the moment in in the direct drilled ones, which um, isn't isn't that great to look at. I might have to go around and spot spot spray them just to uh, suppress them a little bit for next year. Um, can't remember the other question, Joseph. And uh, I suppose we then um, have you, did you plant them direct into permanent pasture or did you spray it off? Spray. Yeah. And I, I suppose in terms of um, whether it's possible to, to do it into permanent pasture, yes, it is. But again, um, it's about resting, resting um, that, that lay um, and trying to hammer that grass really initially. So you hammer that grass hard um, to open the sward up. Um, again, with the herbal lays, they don't need much soil at all. So you could just literally go over with a harrow and then um, you know, broadcast and then roll it. And that's about as much soil depth as they actually need. And then really it's about pulling them sheep on and off um, to give it a chance. And just as it's starting to emerge, pull those those sheep and cattle off them to, to get it away. But again, you don't really want to be putting any nitrogen down um, onto that permanent pasture. Otherwise the, the ryegrass and the grass species there will get ahead. Um, the other the other key thing we, we did mention, um, I think you've got a few creeping thistles floating around there, haven't you? Um, you know, on a few patches. So what I would suggest is the previous season, um, try and take them out with something like Thistle X um, before you get going. So then at least the creeping thistles are out of the way. And then the sword will be a little bit cleaner 
of course, you're still going to have a few issues with the, the spear thistles, um, and then it's a matter of either topping those um, or just going in with a, a spot sprayer, really. And just the, the last question for now, um, how long was the transition uh, for the lambs onto the herbal lays? Um, uh, were the lambs continuously grazing on the lay or did they move back to grass? I think uh, one of the comments here is that some people have found it takes time for the lambs to get going on it. Yeah, the um, the lambs were weaned, they were weaned onto grass first for, for the first week and then they had a bit of a, a transition period where they could walk, walk in and out of the grass field onto the herbal lay. So there was a transition there. Um, I did find that they were quite keen on, on eating the clover rather than the chicory and plantain initially. Um, yeah, so there was a transition and, and that's how we managed it. Brilliant. Perfect. I'll, uh, I'll hide away and let you continue on. Thank you. Uh, could you have the next slide, please? Yeah. Okay. So um, what we decided to do is to, to start on the, some subdivisions. So this is a, a, one of the blocks on, on the farm. So I don't know, do you want to start, Richard, by just saying sort of the area, uh, what you did initially, and I suppose moving on to how you've broken the area down a little bit more? Yeah, the farm's broken into two areas, um, and 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 the, and the picture here is of the of the area which is a fa away from the farm. There's about 180 acres in that block, and this is a 50 acre block here. And when we took the tenancy on there, it was just in two fields a few years ago. Um, last year or the year before, I split it a little bit with some clipex fencing um, into five paddocks, I think. Um, yeah, a pretty set stocked at the time, um, but anyhow, it, Mark came and suggested we probably need to get some kind of subdivision into that. And as you can see, why my my uh, ad hoc pencil drawings there. That's that's what we'd split it into, roughly about one and a half to two acre plots now. Okay, then I suppose how did you? How did you find it initially with with the sheep, and how did you find it to manage, and what were your sort of daily movements with the sheep? Yeah, I have been used to a little bit of subdivision down down at the uh, home farm, so I, I do understand how it works to a certain degree. Um, and the sheep were used to electric fence um, partly, so they weren't they, they were good to deal with. Um, we we kind of set stocked at lambing time. And then we bunched them up pretty quick, probably too quick. Um, after a, after a couple of weeks, they were they were bunching together, and we were just on two daily shifts. Um, I wasn't too keen of going daily because it, it, it just eats your time up. Um, it worked really well in summer. It was a great block of land. It's on that's actually onto limestone um, um, underlying the soil, and it, so it's quite good free drain kind of country. So it's. Um, it's good, it can stand a bit of stock and it looks a lot better than it ever has done now. It, it's really green and and um, looks healthy. Yeah, no, that's good. And what are you, were your plans with um, reseeding and you mentioned forage crops as well on this kind of block of ground? Yeah, yeah, we have the, um, the piece which is actually off the page there in the white. Those two back sections there uh, were the two sections we've direct drilled and um, Spring and autumn, um, and they've and they've come as we've suggested, and and as we move through this block of land, I think we're going to, as Mark suggested, move through each patch and and um, improve that sward by either um, direct drilling or maybe even going in with a forage crop for the winter and then and then freshen it up in the spring. So it, it lends itself to quite a high carrying uh, numbers in there. I would think if we if we're getting working really well. I think um, you've got the area up to about 50 acres now in total. That's 50 acres, yeah, there, yeah. So um, hopefully, I think initially you, you're aiming at 250 sheep when you're on the block, but I suppose potentially is that that's improved and we're, we're aiming for that 30 to 40 percent increase in grass usage or utilisation and growth. You know, there's there's probably potential to push them up to 450, 500 eventually on that block. So. I think um, it's a, quite a dry block and a useful block for you on a quite heavy farm. 
So I think it, it's one of those areas which it's worth uh, pushing a little bit harder than the rest, and I think it could work work quite well, hopefully, with with the rest of those those blocks. But I think the other priority we were, we were aiming to do, uh, because the farm's quite wet, and um, we're trying to rest as much ground in the winter to save it for for lambing, um, that will hopefully allow Richard to build up the covers of grass um, into the autumn, into the winter, and hopefully keep the sheep. Um, out of the way for a little bit while. But do you want to just explain what you, you aim to do with the sheep in the winter and with your sacrifice paddocks to try and um, maintain grass covers? Yeah, um, on that area of land there, we have two uh, two areas sectioned out with bales set out now. Um, so when we've been around after tucking those, there'll be 250 ewes, they'll sit in that five or six acres, eat the bales, and try and keep the rest of that area clean for lambing time um, and, and just use that as a sacrifice area and come back in the spring and, and, and either put your porridge crop in or, or, or just reseed it with a slightly better mix. Um, so that's, I think that'll work there. So fingers crossed it will. Okay, good. Um, right, so uh, moving on to cattle then next. Um, so I suppose before we get into what you're you're aiming or planning to do, uh, what have you what have you long term thoughts being of the cattle, <laughs> and what are <laughs> some of the maybe issues? The bigger, Richard loves the, the bigger, cows. <laughs> yeah, I do love my cows, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I do like my super cows, and I have you know we've had them for a long time. But you know, as as most people in this side of the country, you know, the winters are too long for super cows. They're in, they're in now, well not here, but they will be in the next day or two, and they're out in the first week or two in May. So the profitability of the suckler cow here is very marginal. It probably it's a loss leader. Um, well, it is on my account. So, you know, I'm coming to terms with having to having to get rid of the suckler cows and 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 look at another uh, beef enterprise to, to manage the grass and manage that rougher area of grass that we do have. Um, so I've been open to a few suggestions and Mark's thrown a few ideas at me um, and you know it's the same thing that most people come to is the uh, beef from dairy um, so inevitably that will probably happen shortly um, so that's you know that that's where we're at and, and that's probably where we're going with the uh, the cattle on the farm Richard, you just want to tell that story about your um, that chap you spoke to about his um, uh, how much money he made on his sucklers because I think it illustrates it possibly quite well. I have no names mentioned, but a, a, no a friend of mine um, has had the same difficult decision to make over the last few years, or maybe not difficult, and uh, he's moved on to the the uh, rearing calves or growing calves um, from having 150 suckler cows, I think. Um, and planning on about 300 rearers, and his um, figures suggest that if the if the rearing calf project breaks even over the year, it'll still be 60,000 better off than having the suckler cows per year. So it's a quite a convincing argument to uh, to look at it quite hard. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mark, you're suggesting that um, he possibly buys some groups of cattle in, aren't you? depending on prices and stuff. Yeah, yeah. so it was just looking at uh, something which is nice and easy and um, can be managed quite well. So we're looking at possibly buying in uh, maybe, you know, your Dairy Cross, Angus or something like that um, as weanling. So at 140, 150 kilos around, around about that kind of weight. So really they, they come, they're, they're on ad lib feed. Um, so it just takes a few weeks to adjust them off the ad lib feed onto silage or, or out of grass. If you'd normally have a season at grass, uh, then you'd be looking to, to winter them and then either sell them at 12 or 18 months of age, depending on, on what time of year they're bought really. But um, the only thing I, I mentioned to Richard really, the, the key was to make sure that um, you're buying them at the time of the years where there's most calves on the ground. So obviously, you have a big autumn calving block and a big spring uh, block, so that's when calves are at the cheapest. You don't want to be buying them in the middle of summer when they're they're hundred pound dearer than what they should be. Really. So a lot of the money's in in that margin initially. Um, but from Richard's point of view, it, it's stocking rates because they're they're going to be much smaller 
they're not going to eat very much. And again, if he's going to buy them in the autumn, uh, you know, they're not going to eat very much silage at all through that winter compared to the suction account. So we'll watch this space. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thanks very much, Mark, for that. Thank, thank you. Um, uh, Joseph, can we have the next slide? <coughs> so, very dull slide, I apologise. Um, so Richard um, um, has done his herbal lays and, and because we've because of Corona, we've been doing lots of videos. I've been going to Richard's and videoing him. And I remember specifically one, one we were videoing one day in his herbal lays and it was lambs were grazing in the background and he loved it and, and he was so happy with his herbal lays and was saying how addictive he was. And he said, later on this afternoon, I'm going to get all these lambs in and weigh them and see what their daily life weight gain was. And he didn't phone me back to tell me. So I thought, oh, it's a bit dodgy. So I phoned in the next morning and he's like, uh, herbal lays, they might be all right on some people's farms, but I think we're too wet. And he was very negative about it. And I just thought, oh, so um, the lambs didn't have worms. We'd, we'd done vet counts and, and they didn't have worms. Um, and then we, we did some blood testing. And, and then this is where you come in, Rachel. Um, they did some blood testing for trace elements. And then, um, yeah, can you just talk through the results? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yes, we did a trace element screen. So we checked for um, copper, cobalt, selenium and iodine. Um, for anyone who's not done it before, the copper, cobalt, selenium are all, uh, well, relatively cost effective to check for an individual animal. Um, iodine isn't in that it's about £50 a sample. Um, so what we do for the iodine is do a pooled sample of, if we have blood sampled half a dozen sheep, we only get one result because we take, um, we mix all the blood together to get a result for everyone. Um, so for the lambs, um, what we found is that the aim for iodine um, is to be over 105, I think it's nanograms per mil. Um, in the lambs, the sample came back as 47. So that's definitely down in the inadequate region. Um, so we think that is is fairly important. Um, Nick, do you want me to go on and talk a bit about what it does? Yes, maybe maybe if you could talk about um, well, well, Richard, the lambs just weren't possibly gr growing. Well, they obviously weren't putting on weight, and and I guess Rachel, it's it's the other other things. Um, Richard, you do lose a few lambs at lambing time, don't you? We do, yes. Um, Probably more than I should do. I've no, you know, I've never known really why, because we vaccinate for every conceivable thing. So, uh, you know, this, this this may suggest that the iodine is, is, is impacting elsewhere on the farm as well. Yeah. So that that fits um, with the textbook definitions. Um, so mostly how it's seen is um, weak lambs um, that are potentially not very woolly and poor hair coat um, that like to die as soon as the weather's anything other than perfect, which is yeah, what we see a lot of in Cumbria. Um, it's not a problem um, we can pick up very well in adult sheep in that they don't often show signs and they, they cope relatively well with lower iodine levels. Um, but the problem then comes with the, the lambs that are developing um, whilst they're pregnant. Um, and then we, we see these issues with these, these poor lambs. Um, the textbooks would have you, um, have you believe that you get lambs born with big swollen goiter thyroid glands? That's not something I've ever, ever seen. Um, and potentially the easiest or most convincing way to, mm -hmm. to diagnose the problem is to Post-mortem um, baby lambs that have died and there's a ratio of the weight of the thyroid gland to the weight of the lambs um, when they're born, um, which isn't something I've ever had a great deal of success with um, diagnosing them that way. Uh, it's not particularly easy to, to dissect, dissect it all off to do the weight properly. Um, and for most people, um, they don't want to send 10 or 15 lambs to the lab 
um, to get full postmortems and get get that involved just because of the cost implications. Um, so with most people, we've we end up doing what what we've done here with Richard, and we diagnose it pretty much on the basis of a blood sample. Um, now the the blood sample isn't. 100% reliable. So what we see with the blood sample for the pooled iodine is a reflection of their iodine intake over the last few days. Um, so if the iodine intake continues at that level, then they're probably going to become deficient um, because they can they can store iodine in their thyroid gland for a little while. But obviously, if the levels are continuing to be low, then they're they're going to run out of their their stores. Um, so what we did to follow up that was we checked some use as well um, and we because we knew there was this issue in the lambs we, we added a little bit more onto the testing um, and we tested the use to see what their thyroid function was to see whether regardless of what the iodine level in the blood was whether their thyroid seemed to be coping um, and they all came back as fairly normal. So for the thyroid hormone we were measuring, normal was over 60 and the use were all between 74 and 100. So they were all okay. Um, the iodine levels have just very recently come back this week for the use. Um, as I said, so we want adequate to be 105 and the use came back as 103. So they were just, just and so low, um, but obviously managing to uh, to cope with with the levels that they were that they were getting. Um, sorry, go on, Nick. So I was just going to say. So as far as going forward goes, so Richard, I'm thinking you. How did you treat those lambs, or what did you do? Yeah, just to add to that to what Rachel was saying, there's quite a long running time from taking the bloods um, from the lambs I used to getting the results back. You know, we're talking five or six weeks, maybe. You know, and the problem can drag on forever until you get the results back. So um, that's to bear in mind, anyhow. And what we've done is, um, and with the lambs, we have drenched them with some iodine crystals. I forget now what it's called. Um, and uh, so we've done that, and that's to do every two or three weeks um, because it's not doesn't hang around too long. Um, for the ewes. We have, uh, well, I've done the same. Um, I've drenched the use and I've also bolus the use with a bolus that has iodine and, and, and all the other bits and bobs in, just as a belt and braces, really, because I was getting a little bit panicky that we're getting nearly took time. And um, the results were back for the use. I thought, well, I'm just going to have to jump in and get this done, regardless of what the, what, what, what comes back from the lab. Um, so that's where we're at with that, really. We did have a product, maybe Rachel will talk about the product we were going to import, um, which probably is the ideal stuff, but we couldn't get it. So. Yeah, so the, um, the the different supplementation methods, um, Richard's kind of covered them all. So um, the cheapest one is the potassium iodide um, crystals. Um, so it works out to something like two pence a lamb to, to drench and it's something like five pence a yo. Um, so it's it's very cheap and easy to do. Um, as Richard said, it doesn't um, it, it's not particularly stored. They absorb what they can at the time um, and you know pop a little bit into their thyroid gland to work on. But if what they're taking in on a daily basis is low, then that'll run out. Um, boluses are obviously an option. Um, most boluses come as uh, combination products, so they're usually copper, cobalt, selenium, iodine. Um, and in this case, we know that we don't necessarily need uh, the copper and the seleniums, um, but you can get the iodine out of it. Um, and the other product is one called uh, Depidine or Depidine, um, which we import um, from Australia, New Zealand. Um, it's used a lot over there, but isn't licensed in this country. Um, Iodine is, is really deficient over there. They have they have big, big problems with it. Um, so what it is, is a peanut oil, um, which has iodine um, put in with it. Um, and it's a, an injection um, in the neck. It's supposed to be in the muscle. Um, and it potentially can leave enough 
gradually release enough iodine, um, certainly in the U's, for a year or two um, to keep them keep them topped up. So it's, it's quite a useful product, as Richard says, if we can get it and we can get it into the sheep. Um, so, yeah. So, um, Rachel, as far as next year goes, is this, is this, do you think, been lingering around possibly in the background for a while and it's just this year it's come up or... Um, and how how does he then deal with it next year, particularly if we can't get the Defidex? Yeah, so um, round about us, as Richard said, we're, we're based in, in Cumbria, um, just outside Penrith. So most of the farms that I have um, blood sampled on, there there has been an iodine deficiency to some degree. Uh, so I think it is part of, part of where we are. Um, as a rule, grass is relatively poorly supplied in iodine um, so I think it probably has been something that's ongoing I do wonder now um, so there's some um, crops that are called goitrogens um, so they actually inhibit iodine uptake so they are the brassicas so rape and kale um, but also the legume crops so turnips and, and clover so I wonder whether the herbal lays have exacerbated this particular problem if, if we're low in iodine anyway um, and the clovers especially um, have not helped the lambs absorb the small amount that's there I wonder whether that's exacerbated this problem um, so yeah the options um, we're obviously going to try and be in front of it next year um, and the options are going to be either if we have the, the depidines available um, it is you know relatively more expensive than the drenches um, or coming back to how much time Richard has and wants to put into it when he's weighing his lambs whether he, he is just happy to drench them on a regular basis no to, to try and keep them covered and provide this extra iodine supplementation as they're as we're trying to get the growth out of them. Grand, grand. Well, thanks very much for that. Is there anything else we haven't covered? Do you think on the iodine? Um, Apart from the fact, Richard, you've got a load of lambs still to sell, and you're feeding them. <sighs> <laughs> Well, this is, you know, that's one of the other supplementation methods is because the because the feeds are are mineralized. But yeah, it's, it's very much not what Richard's aiming for. Um, the only other thing that's maybe worth pointing out is that um, you can have too much iodine, um, and especially in late pregnancy. So the 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 depidine, the long acting injection, um, you very much don't aim to put it on board in mid to late pregnancy um you want it in you know at pre-tupping when richard's put in his boluses um and it can actually interfere with the lambs absorbing the antibodies in the colostrum so you can to be fair almost end up with a similar problem you can end up with weak lambs that are dying um so it's yeah it, it's not something you can throw about completely without diagnosis and being sure of what you're doing but yeah we definitely have issues here Perfect. Thanks very much, Rachel. Um, so, Richard, could just give us a quick um, put us in the picture about where what the sheep are doing now. Um, the tups go in in middle November. Yeah, yeah about fifteenth of November, and the fell ewe is about the twenty fifth of November. Um, so, yeah, we just um, yeah, I'm just I'm just stalling them a little bit because I don't want to eat all my grass um, just for another week or so. So they're kind of just. They're just I'm holding them back apart from the thin ones um, and then maybe next week we'll start spinning them around and uh, try and keep that nutrition you know the plain nutrition going on pretty well uh, yeah they look all right the grass levels have uh, have depleted really this last few weeks um, it doesn't look quite as green as I would have liked um, I've tried hard to to protect those covers but um, you know the, the rain and the weather's beaten us a little bit um, on that side yep and and which what what just quickly what rams are you using this year on your sheep um yeah in by use uh, producing fat lambs are focus prime and a few sub techs um and the fell use um are highlanders 
Okay. And the Highland, Just... the Highland is a, what we'll develop as we go forward to to have a full um, a full flock of Highland to use. And move move away from the roughs. Move away from the traditional subsidies, um, sucking type <laughs> sheep. Yeah. <laughs> Quite controversial there, but there you go. <laughs> yeah, Joseph, I just want to move to doesn't really um, um, doesn't need as much subsidy to uh, to function. I want it to be self self reliant and and generate enough income from itself without um, without shoving government money to keep them here. Uh, just a just a quick question while uh, Rachel is, is still there. It's around um, again around iodine. Um, two people kind of asked the questions around uh, blocks, um, feed blocks that you can obviously lay out. Um, someone has given an example where they use them in cattle. Are they available for sheep? Um, obviously, there is the issue that not all animals will actually go near the blocks. Mm, yeah, that's that's very much the issue. Is that the intakes are really variable. Um, I don't know off the top of my head whether there are specific ones. Um, obviously, for sheep, you're aiming for a, a lower copper one, um, for the for the most part. Um, but yeah, that's that is is the main issue is that some sheep will never be near it. Um, another sheep will, will get more than their their fair share. So as a rule, we we find it tends to work better to have each individual animal treated, um, and then you know what they've got in them. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions, Joseph? Uh, no, that's it for now. Some of the questions were about iodine and how it was, um, how you're treating it, but you've already, you already covered that. So yeah, I think we're good. Cover that. Okay, C can we um, have the next slide, Joseph? So, like I said, part of because of Corona, part of um, Richard's kind of um, getting out in front of people has been via videos. And this week, uh, a couple of videos went out on Twitter. Um, and there was one of Richard and his hedges. And this isn't actually Richard's hedge, but um, Richard, we all like a hedge, don't we? Tell us about tell us about that hedge. <laughs> I do like a, I do like an overgrown hedge, which is. Uh really frowned upon in the farming world you know because we we're all been brought up with them having trimmed and perfectly square and what have you but um i have a number of hedges on the farm that have been planted over the last 20 years um yeah and initially i did i did trim them but i've, I've broken out of that cycle now and I, i've left them I've, um i've left them for a few years now and they are um they're a magnificent thing really you know for the wildlife wind shelter and and just just something good to look at especially this time of year when they've got all the change of colors and and so and also and i i, I think also the important point to say is that you're you're on a rented farm aren't you and and but you still love your hedge which is which is great to see but then you, on on the video you talked about how um you'd had a carbon audit done and you showed them your very big hedge yeah. What did they say? Yeah, they weren't overly impressed with the uh, with my idea that the uh, that the slightly mature hedge was some kind of carbon sink, and and um, it didn't register at all as of any importance to uh, to you know to reducing my carbon output as such. Was I was a bit shocked at really because um, I. You know, I, I see things on the news where the all the big uh, petrol chemical companies and the air airplane industry and the airports talk about planting lots of trees. I don't know if they've ever done it. I've never seen any that they plant, and and instantly they can be carbon neutral. And I'm thinking, well, if they can do it and be carbon neutral, surely me with my little my little tractor and my little farm white can be carbon neutral with all this woolly with these woolly hedges around but no that didn't seem to uh, light anybody's fire which was quite um yeah and quite, i think um, just to say i do i don't think all the carbon audits are, are like that i think some do take them into account but it should be kind of a given shouldn't it because that hedge will be there for a long time yeah you know i, I think they do take it into account but it has a, such a mind minute impact on the carbon um 
on the carbon storage on the farm, but it, it, it's re irrelevant if you put it in or not really. Um, and and then I think we have a, maybe about 300 mature trees on the farm. I did have a, a count round and, and have a look at those. And, and that was a very minute amount of carbon that they were allocating to those trees. So I, I think the, the playing field slightly uh, skewed against us at the moment, which is probably government policy somehow. But um, yeah, carbon neutral is not as easy as you think on, um, on a livestock farm. Yeah, and we haven't rehearsed this, Richard, but I'm just going to throw elms in there. What are your um, thoughts, if you have any, on on elms? I think well, we might get. I'm thinking I'm we might get some it. questions coming in if we if we All right. take it. Out. Yeah, I, I've looked at it, and I've you know I'm I'm not in a scheme at the moment because the countryside stewardship scheme isn't isn't really worth the bother, and um, financial worth the bother. And I'm sure the Elms thing will be very similar. You know, there'll be some people make a lot of money out of it, um, but the rest of us will be, it's a financial venture, it will be hardly worth it, um, which which is probably goes against what the government always said it was going to do with the new with the new scheme. The government kind of promised that the, the richest in society weren't going to get all the money, you know, the big landowners and what have you, but it looks like they're going to again in the new scheme. So, um, that's probably been well managed again by the powers that be. Okay. Um, yeah. And then my our last kind of little thing, and it was a very good video we did about um, mental health. Well, not mental. It's, mental health sounds quite serious, but it was all about um, having time off and um, making sure you have that work-life balance. And I think you do that really well. Because if I come to your, yours in the week, you're in the sheep pens, you're charging around, it's just you and, and Layla helps you when, you, when you're stuck. But um, I, I think weekends are, are important to you, aren't they? Yeah, free time is really important. Um, or, or just time away from, from doing sheep things and cattle things. You know, I, I used to be tortured um, in the past, like most farmers are, and worried about what the neighbours think, and you're not working on a Sunday afternoon, there's something wrong with you. But you know, I've broken that cycle, and, um, you know, our weekends are... are my, my time's managed better within the week, and um, so I get I get the stuff that done the needs done in the week, and the weekends, if there's nothing too pressing, we do the, we do kids stuff, or we just, we're just messing around. Um, which is great. It's great. It gives you that break within the, um, you know, the, the, the daily trudge of farming. It gives you a break. You can think about where you're going um, or where you've been. And uh, yeah, it's great. And, and now I'm not really fussed about what the neighbours think because their position is maybe, maybe very different. I don't know. But, you know, I, I'm farming the bit I have and I'm not really that fussed about how other people farm their bit because um, everybody's position is different, either financially or socially or whatever it is. Um, so I just look after hours, my family, and and my time as best I can. And I, well, I, I, you said I suppose you possibly are, are a bit of an oddity there. Not that you're odd at all, yeah. Richard. But but uh, yeah, there is a perception that the hardy, if if you're working hard, really hard, you you go in the right direction. But it's not always necessarily so, I guess. Um, on the future. Yeah. I'm thinking future as in the next 12 months with your with with a strategic farm. The plan is to get some cows, some um, some growing cattle. So, so that's yeah, one big yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, and just continue uh, uh, rolling out the subdivision and trying to master that a little bit better. Um, it, it is more difficult with sheep rotational grazing. Um, they're not quite as easy to manage as a, a cow that will stand behind a, a single wire. Um, it is a bit more challenging and it does come with a bit more cost. Um, the fencing has to be really up to spec. So yeah, that's just it, just more of the same, um, trying, just trying to get a handle on on, on costs as well. Uh, and the, the, the block that we've got subdivided, you're thinking of dividing that up smaller possibly? Yeah, definitely for the summer, we'll have that down into maybe one and a half acre uh, plots. Um, just to manage that grass at, at the peak and just to keep on top of it. 
so that yeah that's the thing and we'll just roll that out um and hopefully get a forage winter forage crop in that in that 50 acres somewhere this this spring and um, which is successful and, uh, and and just try and and, and try and that, try that method really of, of um, improving the pasture as we go around because you did have a disaster this year didn't you with your uh for what was it that the crop was that was a disaster and just wouldn't grow yeah. i don't know if mark's still on the call but it was a good job <laughs> the field was hidden <laughs> yeah yeah i'm glad it was not on the roadside <laughs> yeah it failed twice it just came with a lot of rain at the, at the wrong time and I, I, and i think the slugs had a go at it and it was that wet i couldn't get on with any more slug pellets so we re we redirect drilled it with a with a slightly different product and that and that worked to some degree but it, it really didn't like the soil or something so we yeah we've grazed it off now and it looks a lot better than a patchy um mess that it was with two or three turnips scattered around the tenant yeah <laughs> yeah, we'll yeah so I hope, hopefully uh, there'll be a bit of improvement on the on the trial block of ground really i suppose it it was a bit wet and uh it had a bad starting i think it drowned <laughs> Yeah, it just goes to prove, yeah, the, the, there's an old chap in the village who used to farm next door and it, he, he asked me what uh, what I was doing and I said I was going to put some Swedes and kale in. He says, it'll never grow in that field. And obviously I thought, oh, well, you know, it will do because Mark's told me it will. <laughs> Anyhow, I, I didn't pick the field. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so so that old knowledge from the 50s and 60s, you know, they were doing this, they were doing that them days, and he and that side of the farm, which neighboured his farm, he says you'll never grow it there. You will on other fields, but he says you'll never grow it on that area. And right he was. Oh, but but you so yeah. you haven't been put off your herbal lays, even though you did throw your toys out the pram at mm. one point. You, 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 I am a believer, you know, I keep seeing all the uh, professional farmers on Twitter who, who can get lambs away virtually before they're born on, on herbal lay, um, you know, so, you know, the, the, the stories are right, it, it does work and hopefully it'll work here and then I can be able to claim these really impossible accolades. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph, do we have any questions? Um, yeah, we have uh, we have one or two, um, so I'll just go through them. Sorry, I'm I'm, I'm just laughing at the fact you're calling your uh, your farmer a disaster, but it'd be good that you have a good working relationship. <laughs> um, uh, there was just uh, there's a few mixed around, so I'll kind of start where we were just ending. Um, do you find managing the water, or how do you manage the water for those sheep in the acre, or, uh, one and a half acre blocks? So your water infrastructure yeah. on those. Yeah, I've just got mains water, quite a bit of cross there, put in um put in some new blue blue pipe in, just put it over the top in in and it's in just some small troughs, not very big, two foot square. It seems to be enough for use. Um so yeah, water's in every block. It has cost a little bit, but it's there, and I don't have to drag troughs around or or bowsers around anymore because that is, is something I'm not over interested in. Yeah, and then kind of moving on from that, and then kind of going back to your kind of the, your importance of a work-life balance. Have you found the move away from set stocking has it helped or hindered some of that? No, it's it, it's helped, and it, and there's anybody who is on um, rotational grazing, moving the ewes two or three times a week is probably the best job of of, of the day. It's quite an enjoyable thing. Um, the sheep know when they come and 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 then they whiz through the gate or over the fence and if there's anything dead it's there in the field so you, it is it's easily shepherded <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah no it's been great and, and it is quite addictive as well as um rotational grazing once you get a start you, you every field you look at you think oh, i need to split this field right away so yeah brilliant um and then there was a few kind of questions and comments around uh, carbon um, carbon sequestration of the hedges, how much it um, how much it can or can't do. Um, I think, to be honest, I don't think um, I won't pretend I'm experienced enough or any of us are maybe to answer some of them. But I do think it is a big area for especially for livestock farmers. Um, I think it's a issue around fairness. Do you do you feel like you're fairly treated? And um, there is a 
bigger debate going on that. So there was, you know, a comment here that hedges can sequester up to two to three tons per hectare. So there is a the value in them, but it's how we kind of how do you capture that and get recognised? And I know that's a that's a big debate, and I'm not sure we'll we'll have the answers um, today. Um, that was the main things. Um, just the last thing, obviously, mental health is important, and I don't know if people have picked it up, but it is. Uh, it was World Mental Health Day, I think, on Saturday, and I know there's a lot happening now in the agricultural community, which I do think is is brilliant to see people trying to talk more about it. So it's Ag Mental Health Week. So if, if people are interested in the topic, there is a lot of stuff going on this week, and yeah, have a have a look in. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Joseph. Um, can we just have that next slide? Yep. So, so yeah, on the screen now is just some resources that we've got at AHCB that you can um, go onto those websites and download them. But we do have loads and loads of stuff going on all of the time, loads of podcasts, loads of webinars. Um, Richard is uh, features on one of those podcasts, Richard. Um, so, yeah, we're out there and, we're, and it's just a case of, of tapping into what's available, really. Um, what was I going to say? So on Thursday, next Thursday, my colleague um, Sarah will be talking to um, Chris and Louise who farm over in Lincolnshire. So a similar setup to this, really. So that's next Thursday. And I've got one plea um, that you um, after this webinar finishes, there's a survey that comes up. It's a bit like after you've been speaking to your Vodafone or something. Please fill in the survey. Um, it, it, it gives us a huge amount of feedback on how we can make these these webinars better. Um, and yeah, please, please fill it in. Um, I can't give you anything, but please. Um, and yeah, that's that's all really. Um, Richard, thank you very much. Have you got any any other pearls of wisdom to finish off on? Uh, no wisdom at all, but um, the less of these I do, the better, really. I feel quite uncomfortable speaking. <laughs> <laughs> no, <isn't laughs> that's that's <laughs> Carry on. Um, and also Mark and Rachel, thank you very much, and also Joseph. Um, and I think that's about it, really. Um, yeah. So um, thank you all very much for listening to us and joining us. It's lunchtime, and please fill in that form. And um, we'll see you all again soon. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Thank you.